Well, as I've already told you this morning, we are uh, finishing uh, John chapter 10, uh, which is the chapter that tells us that Jesus is the Good Shepherd, and particularly th this morning, that He is the Good Shepherd who will never let go of His sheep. He gives eternal life to us, and we will never perish, and we're going to see a couple of reasons why that is the case uh, this morning as we look at the fact that Jesus is one with the Father. So let's, uh, let's go ahead and read the text. We'll begin in verse 30, which is really picking up the final verse of what we were looking at last time. Uh, Jesus points out why it is these Pharisees did not believe in him, and that's because they were not of his sheep. Uh, the sheep are known by listening to the voice of the shepherd and following them. Jesus says he gives eternal life to them and they will never perish. The Father who has given them to me is greater than all and no one is able to snatch them from the Father's hand. If you've trusted in Jesus, that's what's true of you. Now again, we're going to see why that is the case this morning when we pick up in verse 30 where Jesus concluded that statement by saying, I and the Father are one. Well, the Jews picked up stones again to stone him. Jesus answered them, I showed you many good works from the Father. For which of them are you stoning me? The Jews answered him, For a good work we do not stone you, but for blasphemy. And because you, being a man, make yourself out to be God. Jesus answered them, Has it not been written in your law? I said you were gods. If he called them gods to whom the word of God came, and the scripture cannot be broken, do you say of him whom the Father sanctified and sent into the world, you are blaspheming because I said, I am the Son of God? If I do not do the works of my Father, do not believe me. But if I do them, though you do not believe me, believe the works, so that you may know and understand that the Father is in me and I in the Father. Therefore they were seeking again to seize him, and he eluded their grasp. And he went away again beyond the Jordan to the place where John was first baptizing. And he was staying there. Many came to him and were saying, while John performed no sign, yet everything John said about this man was true. Many believed in him there. May the Lord bless this word to our understanding this morning. Now, as, I've already, uh, as we've already seen in chapter 10, we've been reminded of a number of things, and particularly these important things, that Jesus is the way by which we come to God. Uh, picture the kingdom of heaven as a very large house where everyone inside and only those who are inside are in fact safe, safe from hell and sure of heaven. There's only one door into that house, Jesus tells us, and he is that door. More than that, Jesus actually stands at the door, the door that he is, the door that he has opened, and he invites you to come in. If you haven't yet come in to the kingdom of heaven through Jesus Christ, listen to his voice and come in. Jesus means it well. He invites you. He wants you to come in. So come in. Hear him. Listen to him. Do what he says. We've, we've also seen that he is the faithful shepherd, the one who not only welcomes you to come into this kingdom, but he says if you will come in, that he will take care of you. He will provide for you everything that you need, not only in this life, but everything that you'll need hereafter. This also means, as what we've been looking at this morning, that he will never lose you. Once you come into the kingdom through him, he will protect you. Uh, he'll protect you not only from yourself uh, so that your sins will not draw you away from him. You'll never want to leave him. But he will do this because he wants to keep you. You are his prize. You are his reward that the Father had promised to him for the work that he has done, for his work of saving you. He's not going to leave you. Uh, this door that Jesus is is really a one-way door. You can only go in. You can't come back out. And once you're in the ark of salvation, then you will always be safe. You know, one thing that we always struggle with as Christians 
is whether or not we're, we're saved. And if we are saved, whether we're going to remain saved. Well, the Bible says that if you are saved, if you've ever been saved at any point in your life, if you've ever truly trusted in Jesus, you will never be lost. I don't know if you caught your attention as I was, um, well, as we were singing this second hymn. Basically, that's what uh, Horatius Bonner was telling us when he says, I bless the Christ of God, I rest on love divine, and with unfaltering lip and heart I call the Savior mine. His cross dispels each doubt. What doubt? Doubt of my acceptance with God, doubt of my salvation. I bury in his tomb every thought of unbelief, every thought of fear, each lingering shade of gloom. You see, that's the result the cross should have in our lives, trusting Jesus. We don't need to be afraid because he will keep us. Now, this is the point that Jesus began to expand on last time when, he's, when he was saying, I am the Father one. If we have trusted him, we will never be lost, and that for two reasons. Because Jesus says, I give them eternal life. Jesus has given you a life that will last forever. And secondly, he says, because no one can take us away from the Father. His infinite hand of infinite power and presence will never be in a place where it cannot hold on to you. Now this morning we see why both of those statements are absolute ironclad guarantees that we will make it to heaven because both of them come from God. They both come from the same God. Jesus says, I and the Father are one. Now what is it that Jesus is actually saying here? What does he mean? Is he saying that he and the Father are basically one in purpose? That they both want the same thing? They both want our salvation? And that's why we will never perish? Well, certainly, that's true. They both do want it. The Father and the Son, the Bible tells us, have always loved us. And everything that they have done, they have done for our salvation. They have done what is necessary to secure us, not just for a moment, but to secure us forever. And of course, for this, we should be very, very thankful. But of course, if that's all that Jesus meant by the statement that I and the Father are one, that we're one in purpose, that we both want to save you and keep you secure, why would the Jews have responded the way they did? Why would they accuse him of blasphemy? And why would they have wanted to kill him simply for saying, I want what the Father wants. I mean, the Jews believed they wanted what the Father wanted. They weren't going to kill themselves for that reason. No, Jesus meant more than that. Now, did, me, did Jesus mean to say by this that he and the Father are one person? You know, there are churches, I'll use quote-unquote churches, that are really cults because they do deny the, the Trinity such as the United Pentecostal Church and the Apostolic Church that believe that that is exactly what Jesus is saying. Jesus is saying, I am the Father. But that's not what he means. He can't mean that because Jesus says, I and the Father are one. He's talking about two different persons here. If they were the same person, why didn't Jesus just say, I am the Father? That's not what he says. Now it is true that one time Jesus said to Philip in John 14 verse 9, he who has seen me has seen the Father, but we do need to understand that Jesus shares the same character, he shares the same nature, he shares the same purpose with the Father so that to see him is to see someone who is exactly like the Father, which is why Jesus says, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Remember, John writes, Jesus came into the world in order to explain the Father to us. He is the one who is his exact representation of his nature, as we're told by the author to the Hebrews. He is not equating the two persons and saying they're the same person, but he is saying that they are the same being, and so they share the same character. By the way, if Jesus meant to say that he and the Father were one person, he also would have used, and this is getting a little bit technical, but he would have used the masculine form of the adjective one, where one person 
instead of using the neuter form, which basically is not person, but thing. We are one thing. What does Jesus mean by that? Well, he means that he and the Father are one being. They are the same divine essence. They are made of the same stuff, although that word stuff is kind of a demeaning term to use for God, but they're made of the same substance. They are one being or one God. Now this not only makes sense of that neuter adjective, but it also explains why the Jews responded the way they did because they understood Jesus is claiming to be God. This is, by the way, uh, it also shows us why the Jehovah's Witnesses are wrong. They believe the Father is God. They believe He's a divine being. They believe He is a separate person from the Son. But they believe the Son is a created being. The Father is God, but the Son is a creature. He is infinitely below God. Jesus says they are both the same. God, they are both divine. Now, I know it's not very popular to point out the errors of other people. Some people see that as kind of cruel. The errors of the United Pentecostal Church, the Apostolic Church, the Jehovah's Witnesses. Why do we need to point out their errors? It's because Jesus says if anyone is to be saved, they must believe that he is God. They must believe it not only because that's who he in fact is. I mean, Jesus says, I and the Father are one. Not only because to believe in any other Jesus is to believe in a Jesus that can't save you. Our Savior has to be God and man in order to save us. But also because Jesus in fact said that you and I have to believe that he is God if we are to be saved from our sins. In other words, that's that's non-negotiable. You have to believe in a Savior who is God. Jesus said earlier to the Jews in John 8 verse 24. Therefore I said to you, that you will die in your sins. For unless you believe that I am He, you will die in your sins. And remember the word He there is simply provided by the translators. Jesus is saying literally, unless you believe that I am, you will die in your sins. What does it mean? Jesus says, I am. What does that mean? It means that He is Yahweh. He is the great I am. He is the covenant God of Israel. We have to believe that in order to be saved. You see, only a Christ who is God and man can save. And that's the reason why I think the Gospel of John, where John is emphasizing that point more than any other Gospel writer. We have to believe in a divine Christ who is God and man. Now, of course, just because the Bible only knows of a Savior who is both God and man, and just because that Savior is the only one who can actually reconcile us to God, does that mean that everyone that we tell is going to believe that and is going to receive him? Well, we know that isn't the case. Look at how these Jews responded to what Jesus said in verse 31. The Jews picked up stones again to stone him. It's not just a matter of truth. We've got to remember there's still that natural disinclination, that natural distaste for God that needs to be overcome. How can we overcome it so that they can be saved? Well, we can't. Ultimately, only God can do that. Remember what Jesus said about his sheep. But there is something he does expect us to do to help them see. And that is we need to point to the evidence. We need to do exactly what Jesus did here. Look at what he says in verse 32. Jesus answered them, I showed you many good works from the Father. For which of them are you stoning me? The Jews answered him in verse 33, For a good work we do not stone you, but for blasphemy. And because you, being a man, make yourself out to be God. Now again, Jesus points to his miracles, not only to show his innocence, but to prove that he is who he claimed to be in order that they might believe. Miracles have their place. Miracles prove Jesus is who he said he is. But now they still didn't believe. 
They still couldn't see how one who was clearly a human being, who was clearly a man, could also be God. Regardless of his miracles, they could not understand something the Bible tells us very plainly, the incarnation. And the reason why they couldn't understand it, the reason why they couldn't accept it, the reason why they continued to accuse Jesus of blasphemy was because they lacked a key ingredient which only God can give, and that is faith. They need faith to believe. Now, we need to remember that. Two things, really. We need to remember that the Jesus that we are to offer to others is more than just a man. We are offering to them a Savior who is God and man. He has to be both in order to reconcile us to God. But we also need to understand that only the Spirit of God can give somebody else the ability to see that and actually trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. We have to rely upon the work of the Holy Spirit, which is why we pray for Him. As a matter of fact, that hymn we're singing this evening reminds us of the very same thing, and so will the sermon. We need the Spirit of God for us to empower us so we can see. Initially, that's how we saw. We need more of the Spirit so we can see more clearly, but the unconverted need the Spirit of God so they can see initially so that they can see their sin, so that they can see the Savior, and so that they would desire Him. So we need the Spirit's work to create faith. But now, does Jesus make this claim to divinity? I and the Father are one, now only to turn around and deny that He is God? That's how uh, many understand what Jesus says next. Let's read verses 34 through 36 again. After they accused him of blasphemy and they wanted to stone him, Jesus says this. Jesus answered them, Has it not been written in your law, I said you were gods? If he called them gods to whom the word of God came, and the scripture cannot be broken, do you say of him whom the Father sanctified and sent into the world, you are blaspheming because I said I am the Son of God. Have you ever read this passage and wondered what in the world is Jesus talking about here? It almost sounds like he is denying his divinity. I mean, is Jesus basically saying to them, let's not get carried away here, folks. Put down the rocks. I'm not claiming to be the God. I'm simply claiming to be a God in the sense that God used the words to refer to the judges of Israel. In other words, I'm not blaspheming. I'm not saying that I am God. Well, think about that for a minute. Does that seem very likely that Jesus would say that after everything that he has already claimed? Remember when Jesus called the Father, my Father? The Jews knew exactly what Jesus meant in John 5.18. For this reason, therefore, the Jews were seeking all the more to kill him because he was not only breaking the Sabbath, but also was calling God his own Father, making himself equal with God. Jews wanted to kill him for that. Jesus didn't deny it. On another occasion in John chapter 8, verses 58 and 59, Jesus said to them, that is to the Jews, truly, truly, I say to you, before Abraham was born, I am. (laughs) Therefore, they picked up stones to throw at him, but Jesus hid himself and went out of the temple. What was Jesus claiming there? He was claiming to be God. He didn't deny it, okay? And does it seem likely that after all that John has written in his gospel about the divinity of the Lord Jesus Christ, such as in the opening verse of the gospel, John 1, 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, If John is emphasizing the deity of Jesus Christ over and over again in his gospel, do you think he would write something like this that Jesus said and leave it unchallenged if Jesus was denying his divinity? Everything he is writing is to prove it. Everything that Jesus is saying is to prove it. Jesus can't be denying his divinity. So if he wasn't doing that, the question is, well, what was he doing? Well, he was actually defending himself. Against the charge of blasphemy through the scriptures using an argument that the Jews should understand and should accept. He was defending himself in much the same way as he did on an earlier occasion or maybe depending upon how the gospels correlate here. 
when he defended himself before the scribes, the Pharisees, and the Sadducees who were trying to trick him with their trick questions, trap him as it were, about whether it was lawful to pay taxes to Caesar, about the woman who was married to the, you know, the several husbands, the seven husbands, and in the resurrection, whose wife of the seven would she be? Those were trick questions that were trying to trap Jesus with. And right now, they're also trying to sew him up with a charge of blasphemy. Now, on that last occasion, Jesus, in order to silence them, basically made reference to Psalm 110. He asked the question, why did David call the Messiah Lord when the Messiah was clearly going to be his son? Remember, the father is always greater than the son. David could not call him this unless Jesus was more than a man, unless the Messiah was going to be more than a man. And that's exactly what he is. He is God in human flesh. Well, he's doing something similar here. As I've said, he's providing an argument that should stop them from accusing him of blasphemy and trying to kill him. Now, in Psalm 82, which I read a little bit earlier, God calls the judges of Israel Elohim, which is a word that is often used to refer to God. It's, a, it, it's the plural of the Hebrew word El, and it, it basically means gods, or it, when it's referring to the true God, it's, it simply means one God, but perhaps that plurality is bearing out the plurality of persons or the plurality of his majesty. But the reason why God called the judges gods was because he had called them and commissioned them to exercise judgment, which is a divine role, a divine prerogative, on his behalf. In other words, they were representing him in judgment. They were exercising something that, was, that belonged to God. And so God, for that, called them. He called them gods because they were doing something that reflected his divine prerogative. Now, if God called these judges gods, who were simply exercising judgment on his behalf, and Jesus says the scripture can't be broken, that is, it cannot err, it cannot make a mistake, what should the one be called whom the Father sanctifies and sets apart and sends into the world for the purpose of saving his people on his behalf? Jesus is saying basically this, if God sent me for this purpose, am I blaspheming because I said I am the Son of God? You see, if God can apply to these lesser judges who are only doing this little bit of work on behalf of God, what about this great work that I'm doing on behalf of God? Is it wrong that I'm claiming to be God? Now, Jesus here is not denying that he is divine, but what he is simply doing is taking away their grounds of accusing him of blasphemy so that they shouldn't want to kill him. Does it work? Well, did the other arguments work? They don't work on people who are unreasonable and refuse to believe because of the hardness of their hearts. Now finally, Jesus points again to the evidence of his claim in verses 37 and 38. Again, why should they believe him? He says, if I do the works of my Father, do not believe me, but if I do them, though you do not believe me, believe the works so that you may know and understand that the Father is in me and I in the Father. Again, Jesus is pointing to his works as the guarantee, as the reason why uh, they should believe that his statement to divinity is true. Now again, the thing is, Jesus is making claim to the fact that he is God. Okay, now ultimately, this is the guarantee of our safety. This is the Savior that we are to tell other people about so that they too might be safe in him. What is our guarantee that we're going to be saved? The divinity of the Lord Jesus Christ. The fact that God the Father is not going to let go of us. Okay, that is our guarantee. But as we go out to tell other people about this Savior, that is also the guarantee that if they will put their trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, they too will be safe in Him. And I just want to remind you to help them see that He is in fact the Messiah. 
we are to point to the same thing that Jesus pointed to, which is basically his works. How do we know that Jesus is who he claimed to be? Jesus healed the sick. Jesus made the lame to walk. Jesus opened the eyes of the blind. Jesus cleansed the lepers. He raised the dead. Only the Messiah could do this, and of course a Messiah who claims to be God in human flesh, his claims must be true. And that is the reason why we are secure if we have trusted in him, because this one who comes down to give us life is God in human flesh. The Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit are all working together in this work of salvation in order to secure us forever. Now again, will they believe us if we tell them these things? Will they believe us if we point to the evidence? Well, the Bible tells us some will believe and some will not believe. And that's the final thing that we see here. Because how did these who heard him respond? They still would not believe. They still wanted to kill him. We read in verse 39. Therefore they were seeking again to seize him in order that they might kill him. And he eluded their grasp. Some are not going to believe no matter what we say, but just because some will not believe, it doesn't mean that all are not going to believe. Jesus has his sheep who will hear his voice and they will believe. You know, we see in these closing verses that Jesus practices now what he told his disciples earlier when he sent them out what they are to do. If, if somebody doesn't receive you, go to the next city. Go somewhere else where there are people who will receive you. That's exactly what Jesus did. He went where there would be those who would receive him. John writes in the closing verses, verses 40 through 42. And he went away again beyond the Jordan to the place where John was first baptizing. And he was staying there. Many came to him and were saying, while John performed no sign, yet everything John said about this man was true. Many believed in him there. Jesus, in essence, went back to harvest in an area where the seed had earlier been planted. It was planted by John, and apparently the ground had been prepared by the Holy Spirit, so now there was a harvest that was ready to be reaped. When in our evangelism, as we're seeking to share the gospel with others, we run into people who don't listen to us, we don't have to continue to work just with them and continue to try to convince them and spend the rest of our lives trying to do it. What we need to do is go back to others that we witnessed to perhaps earlier or maybe somebody else did and share the gospel with them. Remember, just because somebody doesn't receive Christ when they hear the gospel initially and most people don't, that doesn't mean they're never going to receive Jesus Christ. We need to continue to scatter seed as broadly as we possibly can. We need to try to water as much seed as we possibly can. And then we need to remember that the Lord works through planting the seed, actually preparing the soil, planting the seed, and watering the seed until he brings it to the place where it's to be reaped or harvest, harvested in his time. God has his time. So we plant, we water, and we wait upon the Lord to bring the harvest in his time. But let's not forget, we do have the promise that there will be something to harvest. If we don't plant any seed, if we don't do any watering, we can't expect to see any harvesting. We need to go through that process. We need to do it because it takes time. Not always. Sometimes the Lord converts instantly. He's already prepared the ground, there's already been seed. Maybe there isn't seed. Sometimes he makes it all happen really quick, but most often he doesn't. We need to remember it's a process, but if we plant, if we water, there will be a harvest. We need to believe that, and we need to trust the Lord that there will be and plant in that expectation. Well, let's, let's bow in a moment of prayer, and let's ask the Lord to help us to be able to do that.